Today is the day of Pentecost, the birth of the church, uh, the birthday of the church. As disciples were gathered together, waiting on God, the Holy Spirit came down and filled them all with fill, fillness of God's presence. And the church was born. The first lesson is from the Old Testament where the question is raised about who God wants to use to fulfill his purpose. We are reading from the book of Numbers, chapter 11, verses 24 through 30. We are reading from the New Living um, Translation. So Moses went out and reported the Lord's word to the people. He gathered the 70 elders and stationed them around the tabernacle. And the Lord came down in the cloud and spoke to Moses. Then he gave the 70 elders the same spirit that was upon Moses. And when the spirit rested upon them, they prophesied, but this never happened again. Two, de- two men, Eldad and Medad, had stayed, behind, had stayed behind in the camp. They were listed among the elders, but they had not gone out to the tabernacle. Yet the spirit rested upon them as well. So they prophesied there in the camp. A young man ran and reported to Moses, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. Joshua, son of Nun, who had been Moses' assistant since youth, protested, Moses, my master, make them stop. But Moses replied, Are you jealous for my sake? I wish that all Lord pe- Lord's people were prophets and that the Lord would put his spirit upon them all. Then Moses returned to the camp with the elders of Israel. The second lesson is from Book of Acts, where we read about what happened on the day of Pentecost. We are reading from chapter 2, verse 1 through 21 in the New Living Translation. On the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place. Suddenly, there was a sound from heaven like a roaring of a mighty windstorm, and it filled the house where they were sitting. Then what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them. And everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them this this ability. At that time, there were devout Jews from every nation living in Jerusalem. When they heard the loud noise, everyone came running and they were bewildered to hear their own languages being spoken by the believers. They were completely amazed. How could this be, they exclaimed. These people are from Galilee, and yet we hear them speaking in our own native languages. Here we are, Parthians, Medes, Elamites, people from Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pointus, the province of Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and all the areas around Libya and Cyrene. Visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs. And we all, all hear these people speaking in our own languages about the wonderful things God has done. They stood there perplexed. What can this mean? They asked each other. But the crowd ridiculed them saying, they're just drunk, that's all. Then Peter stepped forward with the 11 other apostles and shouted to the crowd, listen carefully all of you fellow Jews and residents of Jerusalem. Make no mistake about this. These people are not drunk, as some of you are assuming. Nine o'clock in the morning is much too early for that. No, what you, was, what you see was predicted long ago by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit upon all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions, and your old men will dream dreams. In those days, I will pour out my spirit, even on my servants, men and women alike, and they will prophesy. And I will cause wonders in the heaven above, and signs on the earth earth below, blood and fire and clouds of smoke. The sun will become dark, and the moon will turn blood red. Before before that, great and glorious days, day of the Lord arrives, but everyone who calls on my name of the Lord will be saved. It's a wonderful thing to be a part of the church of Jesus Christ. Now, some of you, if you ask the question, how long has this congregation been here? One answer to that is about seven years, because that's about the number 
uh, or not quite seven years, the number of years we have been in this place, in this location. But that's not a correct answer in terms of how long the, the congregation's been around because this congregation was organized back uh, in around 1949. And so you could, one answer would be this congregation has been around since 1949, but that's not really even the, a correct answer either because there were a group of people in Robstown that had a vision to plant a congregation in the Cal Allen Annaville area. And so that congregation and their faithful folks have been, had been around for years and years and decades before that. And then, but even that is not the right answer. Because there's a sense in which, because uh, church United Methodist congregations have been in South Texas uh, for way over a hundred years, and but and then you go back even farther than that before there were anything but Native Americans in Texas. Uh, United Methodists uh, were in the United States since the late ninth, 18th century, but even that isn't the correct answer because we heard just now that the church was born at Pentecost. And so there's a sense in which all of us here in this room, in this place, are standing on the shoulders of those who helped move this congregation to our current lo uh, location, uh, on the shoulders of those who first started this congregation back even before at least I was born, and for those who began the Robstown Church and those who, who first uh, pro, uh, planted churches in this uh, area as, as Methodist, and, go, we and then we go on back to Pentecost. The people that we read about in the text from Scripture, we stand on their shoulders as well. And so... Uh, we all have, we're all descendants of all of those people. And they, we have a deep sense of being a part of the community of faith and all of those manifestations. And we are living out the faith in communion with all of those saints of the past as a powerful testimony of the strength of this particular fellowship as well as all those who've gone before us and carrying on uh, imparting the Christian faith to others. That is what we're called to do. Uh, it has been said that the church is the one institution or community that exists not just for themselves, but even more so for those who are not yet part of it. And that's true of reaching people contemporaneously in our own community who do not, uh, who are unchurched, but it also means those who aren't even born yet. And we all have a sense, I think, ourselves of passing on our faith to our children. We present our children to God in baptism. We nurture them in the life of the church. And we're committed to ministries that nurture our children and our youth in the faith. And one of the things that has always been true of grace um, is it has been a congregation that has emphasized the ministry to children and youth. Uh, it's an important part of our DNA and who we are. We recognize as that, our, uh, that our children are part of the commu covenant community of faith because they belong to believing families. Just as the Hebrew people circumcised their young boys and marked them with the sign of uh, the covenant community even when they were just eight days old, we recognize that our children, because they belong to uh, believing families, don't just belong to those families, they belong to all of us. And we aren't neutral about such things. You know, as, um, we, don't, we, don't, we don't think of ourselves as raising little pagans that we hope will one day be converted. You know, one of the travesties of parenthood in our society these days is this philosophy of not influencing your children regarding the faith. I've heard people talk this way in participation in the church. I've heard parents say, I don't want to force religion on my child. I want her to make up her own mind about those things. Or sometimes they say, I'm, not, I'm just not sure what to do. My kids just don't like coming to church. 
Or they may say they complain about coming to church. Let me tell you something. Imagine how preacher's kids complain about going to church. Right, Mary Ann? Uh, Mary Ann's a, P- a PK also. Uh, there's a story about our, our children. When my daughter, Sarah, was four years old, she was in her Sunday school class. And um, the, t- at the church I was serving at the time, and the teacher was talking to these little four-year-olds and asked them if they had any prayer concerns or problems in their lives they wanted to pray about, and you know, for the group to pray for them about. And Sarah raised her hand and said, I have a problem. And she said, well, what is it, Sarah? And she said, I am just so tired of going to church all the time. But you know what? We, we kind of throw up our hands and say we don't want to influence our kids or we don't, they don't seem to think it's important as we do, and so we acquiesce to that. But you know what? They also complain about brushing their teeth and taking baths and going to bed on time and eating nutritious food instead of cake and ice cream for dinner. We don't seem to be neutral about that, do we? If our kids complain about going to school to get an education or about doing their homework, we don't, we don't say, well, he just doesn't want to go, do we? You know, um, I was in a training event for a youth ministry uh, program that church, leaders from churches were being trained in this particular type of youth pro, uh, program that, was going, that they were going to be adopting. And one of the pastors who was part of the training event told a story from his own congregation. And his particular congregation happened to be made up of mostly or a whole lot of Ph.D. people. And he made the statement in trying to talk to his congregation about the importance of this youth ministry. He said that the Christian formation and education of our children is more important than all other forms of education put together. And these people with PhDs kind of sat back and said, what? And then he told a story about a young family in his, in his church where a 32-year-old mother of two little girls who were elementary age uh, was stricken with cancer and went on, underwent treatments and so on and so forth and then died. And he sat up with the dad in the hospital all night long on the night she died and he said would you go with me as I tell my children that their mother is gone and he said they sat on the edge he went in with the dad and they sat on the edge of the bed and woke up these little girls to tell them that their their sweet mother was gone and he and he said to them he said you know how we learned in in church and in this youth program that they participated in about how God loves us and that God holds us in his hands and and how uh, we are, uh, when we die, that, uh, that Jesus takes us in because of he rose from the dead and he went on and talked like that. And then the pastor stopped in telling the story and said, you know, that dad at that moment didn't say, remember what you learned in math class or what you learned in violin lessons or football practice. And you know, sometimes it amazes me the enormously complex arrangement of schedules we parents commit ourselves to for attending our kids' soccer games and football games and music concerts and dance recitals and all the rest, but we can't seem to make it with them to church. But here's point number one. We who are disciples of Jesus Christ and part of the community of faith are committed to doing everything we can to influence our children to be Christians, to raise them up so that any other lifestyle will be foreign to them. So that as they grow up and they choose to live without Christ, which they sometimes do, when they do that, they'll be going against, every, against the grain of every habit and every value that has been instilled in them since birth. Uh, When we baptize children in the United Methodist Church, as we do, one of the reasons why we baptize infants who are not making a choice for themselves at all, we parents are choosing a path for them. And that we're committing ourselves to doing everything in our power under God's direction to bring them to faith. 
This is the tradition of Abraham, who when God entered into covenant with him, he circumcised his son Isaac and all the members of his household. And then Isaac circumcised Jacob and Esau, his sons, and raised them in the covenant of Abraham. And then we read about how through these sons of Abraham, and even though they were all circumcised and were part of the covenant community, they each had to have their own experience with God. As it has sometimes been said, God has no grandchildren, only children. So all of us, no matter what has been, no matter how much I want to bring my kids up in the faith, they have to own it for themselves. They come to a point in their lives where they have to do that. We read of Jacob's own personal experiences with God when he encountered God at Bethel, where he had this dream where he saw this staircase with God's messengers coming up and down, and he said, surely the Lord was here all along, and I didn't know it. He didn't say the Lord wasn't there, but he didn't recognize it until that moment. And then later he had his own life-changing experience when he wrestled with God at the, at the Jabbok River. And then we read in the Gospels, especially toward the end, how the disciples had been with Jesus for three years. They had heard Him teach. They had watched Him minister to people. They had been with Him. But now, at the end, He commissions them, as the Father has sent me, He says, so I am sending you. The preparation time's over. (laughs) The time when riding on Jesus' coattails is gone. And now Jesus is sending them into the world to carry on the very work of Jesus themselves. And so point number two is, Jesus had worked in the power of the Holy Spirit, but now that same Spirit is given to the disciples themselves after Jesus commissions them. So each one of them experiences the reality of God in their own lives. In the Old Testament, we read a few, heard read a few moments ago these two guys, Eldad and Medad, who were prophesying in the camp. And Jesus, Joshua, his, his faithful assistant, came running to him, to Moses, and complaining about that, and considered those guys a threat to Moses' leadership as prophet and leader of the community. And I love what Moses says in response. He says, I wish all the Lord's people were prophets and that the Lord would put His Spirit on them. All of them. And then many years after Moses, the prophet Joel speaks for God and it's quoted in the Acts text where God says, I will pour out, there's going to come a day when I'm going to pour out my Spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Even on my servants, both men and women. That was really countercultural, don't you understand, when this was being said. I will pour out my spirit on those days. I will show wonders in the heavens and on the earth. And then we, what we read about in chapter 2 is just that. God's Spirit is poured out on everybody there. The apostles become not just those who are followers of Jesus, but persons who are themselves directed and empowered by the Holy Spirit, just like Jesus was. And the work that they do is the same work, the same thing that Jesus does. And look what happens. You know, all kinds of amazing things happen. But here here is a point I want to make, too. The amazing thing is that the Holy Spirit is poured out not just on the apostles, but all the people. These all of these people who are part of this faith community, these 120, they say it said, who are unnamed, mostly except for the apostles, unnamed anonymous men and women, all of whom are transformed and empowered and directed by the Spirit of God who experience the reality and presence of God for themselves in their own lives. And look what happens. People are healed. The good news is proclaimed by what they said and what they did. The number of the people in the community of the Messiah 
grows a whole lot more than it ever did when Jesus walked with them. At the end of his life, it says there are 120 followers after three years. Peter preaches a sermon, and 3,000 people are, become part of the community. Think about the implications of that. I don't think it was just Peter. I think it was the Holy Spirit, you see. Now, you young people <laughs> who are being confirmed this morning, three of you have been baptized. One of you will be baptized today and receive the sign that God has claimed you and given His yes to you. For those of you baptized as children, even before you knew anything about it or knew anything about God, but now, for all of you, is the time for you to give your answer to what God has proclaimed, you see. Before you knew anything, God has worked in your life through your parents, through your grandparents, through your Sunday school teachers, through your youth directors, your children's directors, people at Vacation Bible School, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All these faithful people as a part of the church. And now, you're coming to the Jabbok River like, like Jacob You've been wrestling with God for yourself. And this faith into which some of you at least have been baptized and nurtured and you're now being invited to claim as your own and, and for grace who is being baptized to do the same, to claim as your own. God has claimed you and given His yes to you through your baptism, through your parents, through all of those who have nurtured you. But now you're invited to say yes to Jesus for yourself. <laughs> As your fathers and mothers and all uh, who have nurtured you have been commissioned by Christ to be his disciples and his representatives, his, minist his uh, ministers in the world, now Jesus is saying to you, and now I'm going to send you. As the Lord said through the prophet, I'll pour out my spirit on all people. We're going to lay hands on your heads and pray for God to pour out his Holy Spirit into your life so that you will proclaim the good news. You will see visions. You will dream dreams that God gives you. And for those of us who have been part of this church since maybe some of us since before we were born, through the faithfulness of our grandparents and parents and all those who've gone before us and nurtured us in the faith, we all still must own for ourselves the faith into which we have been born and nurtured. We can't ride on the faith of our ancestors. It, it, it brings us to the point where we can respond to ourselves, but it's up to us. God has no grandchildren. And as we confirm these young people as members of this faith community in their own right, as they profess their faith, we, all of us, are called to remember our own baptism, to reaffirm our commitment to Christ, to remember that as Christ has, was sent into the world, Jesus Christ also has sent us and empowered us so that everywhere we go, the power of the Holy Spirit will work through us. Let us pray. Lord, as we gather on this day of Pentecost. Our prayer is, come Holy Spirit on all of us. And as we confirm these young people in the faith and as part of this community of faith, as we lay hands on their heads, that still is our prayer. Come Holy Spirit. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen.